Well, we've been going through Acts, and I want to continue that this morning. We'll see how far we can get. Uh, I only have seven verses, so we'll see how far we can get with seven verses uh, this morning. And it's in Acts chapter 6, and uh, verses 1 through 7. All right, we don't need glasses, right? When I was... Uh, and still, through the years, I've used a, a planner to keep track of stuff, because if I don't write it down, uh, bad things happen. And I've used day timers and generic ones, and for a while there, until they went out of business, I used something by the Franklin Corporation. And uh, Stephen Covey was part of that later on in its life, and he wrote a book called Seven uh, Highly Effective Habits, or Habits of Highly Effective People, and uh, these are the habits that uh, he had in that book. Number one, be proactive. Number two, begin with the end in mind. Number three, think win-win. Number four, think win-win. That is right. Number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Number six, synergize. And number seven, sharpen the saw. That means when the trust is count, the trust account, when you've established trust with people, communication is very good. And the number three thing on the list was put first things first. We used to say stick to the knitting. Anybody remember that phrase? Stick to the knitting. <laughs> yeah, way before your time. Keep first things first. And I think as I look at these first seven verses of chapter six, that this concept of keeping the first, keeping the most important thing first really comes out uh, to me. Do you know that 90% of people end up living their lives and then dying with regret? 90%. They die with regret. Uh, here are some common regrets. Not spending more time with the people I love. Not being kinder to those I love. Not being true to myself. Being too afraid to express my feelings. Losing touch with my friends. Uh, not letting myself be happier. Now, there's different lists in different places, but here's the question that I want to ask. After we die, and when we stand before the Lord, will we have regrets then? because that's what's really important. How about after death? There's something called mission creep. Have you heard of mission creep? You start with one thing and then the mission changes and you get off track doing other things that are not really part of the main mission. It can be hardships, it can be because of success, it can be because of opportunities. Sometimes opportunities can be temptations in disguise. But there can be all kinds of reasons, and they can be, some can be good, and some can be bad. But it's missions creep. And so we have to be careful not to, be get, not to get caught up in something called missions creep. Now, having said that, let me remind us of two things before we really get to the verses themselves. Number one, Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive. All right? It is, Luke was a historian. And so he wrote things, he described what happened, but it does not necessarily say, this is what we ought to do. You understand that? All right. I mean, there's a lot of things written about King David that is not something we ought to do. And there's things written about other people that they're not necessarily things that we should do. So it's descriptive. It's a history, not a template. Number two, it's not the story of a superstar church. It was the beginning church. Uh, and it, it didn't necessarily have superstar Christians, although they did some pretty incredible things. In Matthew, it says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is something that God put in place, and he foretold it. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 16. So let's take a look at the first two verses. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, what were they doing? 
increase. They were growing. We love to see that. While they were growing, there was a complaint by the Hellenist, and they rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the 12, the uh, disciples, summoned the full number of disciples, and they said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. <clears throat> when I was uh, first hired into ministry, I went before a board, and one of the questions that one of the people on the board asked was this, will you clean the toilets? I was being hired as a minister of music. How would you answer that question? It's an elders. <laughs> said the deacon. Said the deacon, right? And I considered it kind of a trick question. I'm not sure it was meant that way, but I considered it kind of a trick question. And so my answer was, if that is the most important thing for me to do, sure. All right, if that's the most important thing, no problem. And I've done it, all right? Um, I reamed out the septic system here and found a T-shirt, got flushed down a toilet. So, um, but keeping first things first. So the Satan has attacked the church, all right, this early church. Um, first, there was direct opposition and intimidation because the priests arrested them and they took him in, they beat him, and then there, there was Ananias and Sapphira, there was that whole thing, and Satan was working to try to cause problems and to keep the early church from growing. And now we have this new strategy, which is, we might just label it, divide and conquer. We're going to stick a wedge between the Christians. We're going to make a wedge in there, something that's already a little bit of a touchy area, and I'm just going to stick something in there to make that explode and cause problems. The good old days of the early church were quickly uh, coming to an end. They were hitting things that they hadn't uh, hit before. And so there are two groups of people here. There's the Hellenists and there's the Hebrews. Uh, the Hebrews were more inclined toward the Jewish culture. The Hellenists were Jewish people who had been spread diaspora. They were spread all over the Roman Empire. They were in, in different places. And so these two groups looked at each other with suspicion. Um, so the, the Greeks, the Hellenists, the Jews thought they embrace this Greek culture too much. They are too much a part of the culture around them, and they're not enough of the Jewish culture. And, of course, the Hellenists looked at it another way, and, and so if you wanted to simplify it, you could say the Hebrews regarded the Hellenists as unspiritual compromisers. And the Hellenists regarded the e Hebrews as holier-than-thou traditionalists. We would never argue about something like that, would we? Remember, these were all Christians. They, they were, and they were all Jewish. So it's not like they were, you know... Uh, different in that way. In James it says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So there was an important thing in those days, and it's, it's an important thing for us as well, that uh, there was help to widows and especially the elderly, because remember, they had no other systems in place. There were no other systems in place to help them. They didn't have the micro pantries, and they didn't have other governmental aids. And so if they didn't have family, there was no help. And typically, it was the, the, the priests and, and their job to make sure the widows were taken care of. But it's thought because Peter continued to preach and the others continued to preach that the priests took their hands off and said, take care of it yourself. And so there was an opening for trouble between them. Um, and, and just, uh, again, Satan loves to take an unintentional wrong 
and make a big conflict out of it. So uh, they present the men to the apostles, and, uh, and then they come up with this uh, process where they said, look, it's not right. We're doing a work that God called us to do. This other work is still important, but we are not going to be the main ones to do that. Not because they were unwilling, because it wasn't the main thing. Stick to the knitting. Keep the main thing the main thing. Don't get sidetracked for long periods of time. I've done about every job in the church that you can do, but I don't want to do all of them all of the time because I get sidetracked from the main thing that needs to continue to be the main thing. We can do that. It's not just pastors that, I mean, it's all of us. We can get caught up doing other things and we can forget that God has called us all to a purpose. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. Starting here, moving to there, moving to there, moving to there. And so keeping the main thing, the main thing. So people make a big deal out of this scripture. Let me ask this question. Should we have deacons? Said the elder. <laughs> and I say that in terms of polity, all right, governance. Maybe. Remember, Acts is descriptive, not prescriptive, all right? So maybe, maybe, maybe it works. We have elders and deacons. That's our system. But it doesn't mean that's the only system because Acts isn't saying this is how you need to do this. And people argue about this kind of stuff. What is that? Sidetracks. Getting off the main thing. And so um, the early church and, and Peter and, and those that were uh, the main spiritual leaders, they were careful not to get distracted and be pulled off the main course. So how does this apply to all of us? Um, well, number one, we need to fulfill our own calling. And I have to know my calling. What is my purpose? What does God have for me to do? A lot of times when you ask people what God has for them, they say, well, to, to serve God first and family second and church third. But our, com our commission is bigger than that and maybe more specific than that. And the Bible does say, and I alluded to it in just a second ago, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. That is the main thing for all of us. It's the main thing in our families. It's the main thing with our children. If you have unsaved parents, it is a main thing for you. With your friends, with people you work with, it's our main job. In the military, you might have... Um, a main goal to defeat the enemy, but you might be assigned with the job of feeding everybody in, the, in your uh, battalion or whatever. And so you have a specific role. There are lists in the Bible. Let me read some of the things that are in the Bible. These are skills and spiritual gifts, administration and apostle, discernment, evangelism, exhortation, faith, giving, healing, helps, hospitality, knowledge, Leadership, mercy, prophecy, serving, speaking in tongues, teaching, sometimes known as shepherding, wisdom. There's lists, and there's things that probably should be on the list that are not on the list. In the Old Testament, we have craftsmen. This, these were experts in wood or stone or bronze or whatever. Those are skills. Those are skills. And so the, these lists, again, are not meant to be all, they're, they're not necessarily everything. They are some of the things descriptive to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good so we can have many many things here we can't fulfill our assignment if we don't let go of what's not our assignment somebody say amen jody has been going through things and She's saying, 
If I don't have to have it and it doesn't bring me joy, I'm getting rid of it. Yeah, and it's all my stuff. That's right. I... <laughs> How did you know? Hey, when you see her, say, why are you throwing off Pastor Ray's stuff out? <laughs> that ought to bring some interesting conversation. It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Um, Jesus, you know, Jesus healed uh, lots of people, and he did it to heal people. He had compassion on people. Um, it, uh, it helped draw the crowds to hear the message. But there is a, in, in Luke, in chapter 4, it says this. He said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose, uh, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So he was not primarily, his primary job was not to be a faith healer. He did faith healing, but that wasn't his primary job. He said, I must needs go to Jerusalem. My primary job is to go to the cross. And so he kept... He kept focused on that. He knew he needed to pray, so he went up to the mountain. And he got away from everybody, and he prayed. He understood those things. Um, so he, he had clear, clear vision of what his mission was. As long as we stay on our mission, we will fulfill our mission. The burden is not to succeed. The burden is to obey. Several years ago, um, well, let me back up. One thing I've said, Will, I don't know if you've said this, but I, I was a youth pastor and did music for five years. And when Jody and I came here, the thing that kind of lingered in the back of my mind was, did we do those, did we, did we do what we needed to do with the students at the time? Did, did we hit it, you know? Was it, was it more than just doing programs? Was, were we affecting lives? And you don't always know, and, and, you know, it was so good that these guys gave Pastor Terry applause and yay and cheers. That's a little feedback, and you kind of know you're on the right tr track. And then um, a few years after that, a couple guys came to this service, and um, they were really big guys, and they sat down front, I think the ushers came, hey, there's, you know, maybe some troublemakers in our church. It turns out they were two of the youth um, from the youth group, and they came here simply to thank us. So you wonder, you know, have I done the most important thing? But, but it, the thing isn't that we, that we don't do it because we're getting success at the time. We do it because we are obeying what God said to do. You may plant a seed. You may pray for somebody, and they, didn't, you know, they don't want it, or they didn't get what they wanted, and so they're mad at you. And the goal isn't to succeed. The goal is to obey God and what He tells you to do. Well, I need to put a caboose on this. Let me read a story. William Borden. He wrote about living with no regrets. In 1904, William Borden graduated from Chicago High School, a Chicago High School. As heir to the Borden Dairy Estate, he was already a millionaire. For his high school graduation present, his parents gave him a trip around the world. How would that be for a graduation present? As the young man traveled through Asia and the Middle East and Europe, he felt growing burden for the world's hurting people. Finally, Borden wrote home to say, Never touch the side of an iPad. He wrote home to say, I'm going to give my life to prepare for the mission field. And at the same time, he wrote two words in the back of his Bible, no reserves. 
Indeed, Borden, Borden held on to nothing, he held nothing back. During his college years at Yale University, he became a pillar in the Christian community. One entry in his personal journal that defined the source of his spiritual strength simply said, say no to self and yes to Jesus every time. During his first semester at Yale, Borden started a small prayer group that would transform campus life. This little group gave birth to a movement that spread across the campus by the end of his first year. 150 freshmen were meeting for a weekly Bible study and prayer. By the time Bill Borden was a senior, 1,000 of Yale's 1,300 students were meeting in such groups. Guys here in the front row, don't give up on these groups at school. Don't give up. You may hit roadblocks. Don't be surprised, but don't give up. Borden also strategized with his fellow Christians to make sure every student on campus heard the gospel. He was often seen ministering to the downtrodden in the streets of New Haven, but his real passion was missions. Once he narrowed his missionary call to Kansu, the Kansu people in China, Borden never wavered. Upon graduation from Yale, Borden wrote two more words in the back of his Bible. No retreats. In keeping with that commitment, Borden turned down several high-paying job offers and rolling in seminary instead. After gradu graduating, he immediately went to Egypt to learn Arabic because of his intent to work with Muslims in China. While in Egypt, he, contra he contracted spinal meningitis. Within a month, 25-year-old William Borden was dead. Prior to his death, Borden had written two more words in his Bible. Underneath the words, no reserves and no retreats, he had written, no regrets. Keep the first things first. Would you stand with me? Let's bow our heads. And if you say, yeah, I need to and want to do that more, just slip your hand up. Yeah. Yes. Father, we need reminding. We have so many things that pull us this direction and that direction. And um, not necessarily bad things, but things that can pull us off the main objective. And so thank you, Lord, for this reminder of uh, keeping first things first. Help everyone here today, those that raise hands, keep the first things first. In your name we pray. Amen.